we need to start making more conscious material choices. I set up an initiative called Make Fashion Circular. It's a tsunami of change. Hello and welcome to The Diff. The Diff is Ellen MacArthur Foundation's online events series that aims to bring the circular economy to life. My name is Colin Webster and I'm the host in this session. I'll be putting questions to two young circular economy businesses um, through the next 40 minutes or so. But I'm going to ask you people watching online to chip in with your thoughts and questions throughout the session too. Use the hashtag ThinkDiff on Twitter or use the comment section on the page you're watching this on and the team will push your questions through to me and I'll make sure that our guests get to hear them. So later on today, we're going to hear from a, a young Swedish business that is helping to bring the sharing economy to the masses. But before we get there, and since we're sitting comfortably, let me tell you what, let me ask you this rather, what would it be like to live in a world without waste? That of course is one of the outcomes that the circular economy aims to achieve. Now I get to work for the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, so I work with the concept every day, but I very rarely get to put the concept into practice. Our first guest here does get to do precisely that. She moves out of concept into practice. She's built a fully modular sofa that can be packed up and moved whenever the owner moves house. And what's more, she's been pretty clever with the materials that she's used in that process too. So joining me is Saskia Gores. Saskia, how I, are you? I'm really good. Uh, Saskia, so you built a modular sofa. What on earth does it look like? Well, we're sitting on it, so that's how it looks like. Uh, but the idea is that you can actually change it how you want it to look like. So you could make it a three-seater, a two-seater, a one-seater, a four-seater, an L-shape. Um, and then later on, we'd like want to change, um, you can change the color, you can change the um, armrests, or like if you want to have like higher legs or lower legs to like ease standing up, etc. So it's, it's your sofa, it's your sofa for life. So that's, that's how it's going to look like. Hang on, you're saying if I own this sofa here, this two-seater, yeah. it could somehow be transformed into a three-seater? No, it's like you would buy updates and add-ons. So like you kind of like, it's, you get a start to your mod like package, which is a one-seater you're sitting on. And then you can buy add-ons, so you could make a one-seater, two-seater, three-seater, etc. And then in a few years, we hope that we can like update the style as well. So maybe um, we don't know what's the style in like ten years, but then maybe you could just change the look of the sofa by exchanging components like the armrest or the backrest instead of the whole new sofa, which reduces waste and is cheaper for you as the user. And we get these continuous sales. So that's the idea. But um, if I owned something like this, getting it out of my house and getting it back to you would be a real struggle, right? Um, so the idea is that um, we are working with a delivery company in a moment so that if you want, for example, um, you want to have new covers, like you want to have a, new, um, a different color, you would order them online. Um, you, um, like you order them online, then our delivery company brings them to you and then we pick it up from you. And then when we have it in our, company, like in our like manufacturing place, then we look at it and have a look at like, what's the condition of it. So if you only have to wash it, like industrially clean it, and then we can sell it again. Then you get a reward for like looking after your sofa covers. Um, and so we're kind of, <coughs> we're going to have like three different like A, B, C kind of categories. Um, and if it's category C and we can't really do anything with it, then we are going to be, take the responsibility that we recycle it or we know what we're going to do with the material so that none of the parts of the sofa end up in landfill. That's the, yeah. But I guess what I was really driving at there was there's uh, another clever aspect to this. It is modular, which means yeah. it can be put into a box. Yeah. So it's absolutely flat pack, which kind of helps us um, in the beginning to like ship it out to people or like um, send it over. Um, but it also makes it easier for you to move and get it up the stairs and through doors. Um, yeah. So. And uh, we are sitting on it just now, as you've told us. Yeah. To get into this building, our viewers at home won't necessarily know, but there's a very <laughs> narrow winding staircase, which for most sofas, most furniture, that should be a really tricky job, but you managed to get this up because it packs up quite nicely. Well, with your team, um, but it <laughs> was a bit of a job, yeah. Uh, we uh, put together a video uh, yesterday when Saskia came here with the sofa uh, to show how it's all assembled. So I think here's a 30 second guide to putting together a sofa for life.
So there you go, how to build a sofa in 30 seconds. <laughs> exactly. Uh, how long did that actually take to put together? I think it was about 10 minutes, maybe 15. Ten, yeah. That's very impressive. It's quite, it looks very energetic when we see it in that stop motion <laughs> kind of way, but is it a tough job to put something like this together? Um, not really, like it's, it's pretty straightforward. So we just gave it to um, a few users and they, they managed to figure it out. So, but obviously the sofa would come with an instruction manual as well. So to make it easier and we're going to have instruction videos up as well. So um, it's a bit more like a puzzle. So you mentioned before it's modular in the sense that people could say upgrade the colors. Yeah. Um, they could move to uh, uh, bigger sofas. Is, uh, is, is that the principle behind the modular? It's purely that people can upgrade and, and change the sofa as they move through their um, lives? So I think there's like different um, aspects for the, like, especially like for circular economy design that it has to be modular. Like first of all, um, that it is easier, like that you can extend the lifetime by repair and updating and that it like, like um, adapts to the needs of the person throughout their life. But then in the end as well, that we can take it apart into material components without um, having any clues um, or staples. Um, and so like everything in here, I could like take apart into the material components and then recycle it. And for like that, fa like that part, it has to be modular as well. What problem are you really solving by making a modular sofa? Um, well, in the moment, they're not modular and they're, therefore like every sofa ends up in landfill. Like that's a, like the, because the materials used in the moment and because of the clues and staples again, um, every single sofa ends up in landfill in the moment. And I didn't really realize it until I started looking into it and I was pretty shocked by it because it's, it's big and bulky, so it's quite expensive for the council. And then in the end, it just like fills up our landfills. So um, with like a modular sofa, it doesn't. So take us back to the, the start of the process where you designed this. You were at university yeah. in Glasgow. Glasgow School of Art and University of Glasgow. So I did product design engineering, which is yeah, product design and mechanical engineering, which was quite good because you get, kind of get the base of like actually doing all the testing um, and then actually building something in product design. Um, and so I worked for a research institute during the summers looking into circular economy and I was totally intrigued by it. And I was like, this, this is the future. Like there's nothing um, like, we have to change, there's no way that we can go forward like that. So um, I was like, okay, how can I translate that into product design? Um, and I wanted to strategically redesign a product without, like in a uni setting, without having to think about the kind of economic um, considerations and just always make the sustainable decision. Um, and then I was like, okay, uh, Sofa is a very iconic household product. And I started looking into that and I started talking to users and went to the recycling centers um, and just kind of like really got engaged and like figured out what's the problem. And so on the one side, it was that it's not recyclable and the fit lens ends up in landfill. And then on the other side, I talked to all the users and they were like, well, they couldn't wash it, they couldn't repair them, they couldn't transport them, and they couldn't change the size or the, the color or the styling. So that was the main reasons they were throwing sofas out in the first place. Um, and then I just started conceptualizing um, and they had loads of prototypes and started building the sofas. And then um, since a year, we've been growing with a little team um, and they really helped to make the sofa like manufacturable, economically viable and look, it looks much nicer as well. So <laughs> that was our journey so far. Do you think this appeals to a particular demographic? Um, so I think there's like different selling points for different de demographics. So obviously I think the modularity and the portability really like works for younger people that move quite often nowadays um, and people that are renting and then like just kind of like stay in a place for a few years and then instead of having to having like yeah to, like if the sofa can adapt to different spaces I think that's quite clever um, but then because the covers are washable and you can exchange the kind of cushions that like really works for families as well and like people that own pets um, and yeah so I think that's kind of in the Kind of democrat and then we've been talking to businesses as well because they're quite interested to like show their corporate social responsibility and um as this is kind of the first touch point for any client in the reception area it's like well do you want to start telling your story of the circular economy already in the reception area yeah. nice idea yeah um and i like this idea of customers being able to return parts so you you envisage having a relationship with customers beyond that sale yeah so i think it's really important that um because we already know that recycling is so difficult and we're not going to have a bin at home for everything. So I think it's really important for businesses to take this responsibility and try to get their materials back. But in the end, so we've done a financial model and I mean, it's really hard. I think that's one of the tricky parts because it's not been really done before. So it's really like you have to kind of start from scratch um, with like these financial models. But in the end, we hope that we actually can make a profit by then like selling the components we get back second hand again. 
um, and or like be able to reuse the materials we're getting back um, in the cushions again. Um, but yes, yeah, so I think that's quite quite important um, for the circular economy part. Uh, and I understand you've done a, um, a comparison in terms of life cycle use, carbon emissions, your sofa versus the typical sofa. Can you tell us about what you found? So the problem with conventional sofas is the materials that are used. So it's the kind of like the plastic forms are not just and that it is um, fossil fuels, um, but it's also the gases that are um, used in the forms are really um, like bad for the environment. Um, and then the like most of the covers and sofas are kind of polyester, um, and then everything is glued and stapled together. Um, and then the whole sofa is covered in fire retardants, like the chemical fire retardants, because the foams are so flammable. So I think that like the kind of material choice is very unsustainable. Um, and then that kind of translates back that in the end you can't recycle it. Um, and so that's kind of the, the biggest impact of it. Um, and then we did a life cycle assessment where we considered the materials we used, the manufacturing processes, the delivery, because we are really trying to like produce locally, um, and then the, the use time and the lifetime of the sofa. Um, and the calculation we've done a year ago was that we would actually save about 90% of the carbon emissions of a sofa. Uh, usually when people talk about uh, those type of environmental benefits that comes with a cost to the user yeah. because it costs more to produce, there's standards to be met and so on, how, how does, uh, tell us something about pricing uh, versus typical sofas. Um, so we, our sofa is going to be a bit, like it's going to be more expensive than a sofa that you get in Ikea, but uh, we don't, like I don't think we can be co compared to Ikea um, and the, I, I, like we, throughout our process, I, I was a learning curve for us because I didn't realize how much more expensive it is to produce locally. Um, and I don't want to go away from that because I think it's really important for the economy, for the environment. And also like ethically, I think it's really important that we pay people the right wages. So, um, but going through that process and like realizing that that puts up the cost, I'm just looking at every product I own. I'm like, how on earth can I buy that so cheaply? So it's a bit shocking actually. Yeah, we don't, um, yeah, so, Yes, heard heard that sort of tale before. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Really impressive that you're looking at the, that whole every every side of the picture. Yeah. Um, a question's come in here uh, asking, are you considering any other household products, uh, or have you got enough on your plate with sofas? For now? <laughs> so just now we're doing sofas, yeah. um, but our name of the company is Designed for Life Limited, and our aim is that we want to redesign everything we own at home, so that we um, can have a bed for life, a table for life kitchen for life, curtains for life, etc. So because I do think that we have to, like if you want to facilitate a circular economy, we have to start with the products and the product design um, that they can facilitate a circular economy, yeah. Okay, you've told us a great deal about the what, we know what the sofa yeah. is, we know why you've developed it, but how did you go uh, about uh, moving from the concept of, hey, we could make a sofa here, to actually doing it? What, what sort of background did you have that enabled you to put all of this together? So I've done product design engineering, which was really helpful for like actually like the product design um, and like also the kind of like graphically being able to present it well. Um, but I've been winning um, a few awards like quite early on and they had like business trainings in it. And then we had really good business advisors and a really good kind of support network. And they really helped to kind of like guide us through the steps to where we are now. Um, and like it helped financially and like the kind of like support wise which was really, yeah, to, like really important <laughs> because I mean, I don't have a business background and I've been learning so much. But I think that's like what I enjoy most in the moment that it's like every day is different. It's like every day I learn something new. Um, like so today I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> I guess um, what you're saying is you're becoming more well-rounded as a result of setting up your own company. Absolutely, absolutely. And you, you, um, you're about to launch this on Kickstarter. Yes. What, tell us a little bit about that. So um, we are going to be at the London Design Fair next week for people to like be able to actually have a seat on it. Um, and then in the beginning of October, we're going to do our Kickstarter campaign where people can support us um, and they can buy sofas. Um, and then we are going to produce them afterwards um, and then like hopefully like, like deliver them in the next, like in the beginning of 2020. So. Super, we're gonna come back to the, the whole process of setting up your own business yeah. and so on in a few minutes time. And we've got another guest to bring in. We can have a conversation between the three of us on that. So don't go anywhere, stay in the nice comfy seat. Um, and let me say now that we're in a second, we're going to switch to our next guest. Um, but before we go to do that, 
Let's look at a clip of a film that we put together last year called System Reset, where the concept of the sharing economy is introduced. And pay attention, because that's what we'll be asking our next guest about. Well, at its best, the sharing economy gives, it gives every individual access to everything, maybe knowledge, maybe funding, maybe certain products, maybe home, maybe transportation. Uh, so at its best, the sharing economy gives everyone access to everything that's already there. Um, Amsterdam Sharing City started with research that we did, where we found out that 84% of Amsterdam citizens are open to the sharing economy. And at the same time, we learned about Seoul Sharing City, Seoul, South Korea, which was the first sharing city in the world. And we saw the opportunity and we're thinking every movement needs its first follower, you know. If it's just Seoul, it's never going to be much bigger. So uh, uh, we went for it in Amsterdam and there was a classic window of opportunity because both of us were giving a, a presentation in different places in Amsterdam, speaking to rooms with a lot of policymakers in the room. And in my case, instead of speaking a lot about my research, I kept that to only a couple of minutes. And then I pitched in 15 minutes or so the potential of Amsterdam sharing city. But as soon as we started talking to different organizations within Amsterdam, because we really believe that it shouldn't be only a governmental uh, perspective, but really from the city broad, is that there was a lot of enthusiasm to, uh, to uh, pick up the sharing economy and really see the city as some sort of a test bed and just say, OK, for all of us, it's really new. There are opportunities, there are challenges, and let's address them also together. So as you heard in the video there, the sharing economy is everywhere, and yet it isn't. Our next guest believes uh, one of the problems we have is that the incentives aren't quite in the right place to make the sharing economy widespread. Ula, what do you believe needs to change to make the, the sharing economy uh, more a part of our lives? Uh, well, I believe that, that uh, trust is basically the essential part of the sharing economy and actually having people trust each other to an extent that they are actually daring to have those kinds of interactions and also have the courage to to have that interaction with another person when something might go wrong. If you share an asset and, and the asset breaks, then you're going to have not only like the problem with a broken asset, but also the social stigma of actually having to deal with breaking someone else's things which is a lot harder than breaking a company's things or breaking your own things. And your solution to that is something we're obviously going to build and build up to. Uh, before we get to that, Ola, I like the origin story of where your company Omicom has come from. You did some work with the Swedish government a few years ago. Can you tell us about the work you did there and how that's built you up to launching a company now? Yeah, I had no plans whatsoever to become an entrepreneur or, or to work with the things that we're working with. I was working with trade and, and trade policy for the Swedish government for eight years. And I was an expert on sharing economy and circular economy, one of the few back then in 2015 when we started with Omicom. And uh, basically when, when the sharing economy first came, the, the regulator had a, had a hard time assessing what this new phenomenon was and how to tackle it from a lot of different perspectives. So we had the Ministry of Environment that really wanted to push uh, this phenomenon because they, they believed, and I think rightly so, that it was something that was good for the environment. And then we had the Ministry of, of Labor looking at it from that perspective. That's going to have it if we have an, an Uber economy with Swedish labor law and all those kinds of things. We had Ministry of Finance looking at the tax issue uh, of people sharing stuff rather than companies. We had Ministry of, of Enterprise looking at it from the perspective of how can we get the next Swedish Airbnb on the market. So we had all these kinds of different uh, initiatives and nobody really knew what was going on. So. What we do in Sweden then is we, we have a lot of committees and we put experts together in, in lots of different committees to look at the, 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 um, the question from different perspectives. And I was in a bunch of those committees. But when we were working with the Ministry of Finance, specifically on consumer perspectives, we kind of noticed that insurance was a big piece of the puzzle that was missing. So in able to get people to actually have the courage to share their assets, they needed to be covered by good insurance. And the, the specific uh, homeowner insurance that we have today didn't cover them. So 
we had a problem and and I was sent out basically to talk to the the insurance business and all the traditional insurance companies and try to make them do something about this and they just couldn't so then we decided that we had to start an insurance company basically you tell to address some, this question. Tell us a bit more about why why they couldn't. It seems like there's a real opportunity landing on the table of insurers because we've got this great disruption to the economy that you've just talked about. All these digital tech companies coming into not just Sweden but everywhere around the world and every nation is grappling with this problem at the same time. And there it seems there's something landing on the doorstep of insurers. They're, they're not taking the opportunity. Why did you find they didn't? First of all, the, the, the Swedish platforms that we were talking to, that we had at the table, their, their, their transaction data just wasn't big enough for that to be a market opportunity that they would grab. And secondly, they don't have the data in order to do the risk calculations that they need to do in order to set an insurance premium. So basically, when you share something in the sharing economy, you have a lot of data on the person owning the object. It, it's a... Uh, a system and a risk calculation model that is entirely based on ownership. So they have a lot, a lot of data 200 years back on people owning stuff. But when you share something, you basically let the thief into your home in that sense. So they don't have any data on the persons that are actually breaking the objects, which becomes a problem. And then they can't set a, a risk premium. I like how you put it when you, you talk to me off camera about the, the Airbnb example and how insurers would look at that if the situation developed. Could you tell us uh, your example there? Yeah, basically, if you, if you always calculate the risk based on the ownership of the thing, then you have a situation where if I share my home with three people and those three people all break stuff in my home, then my insurance premium is going to go up. And that's not creating an incentive for me to rent my home out. And it's not creating an incentive for the people that are just renting the home to be careful with your home because they don't they don't carry any of the risk. So what we try to do is basically flip it over so that you're going to be able to rent your home out and the risk premium is not going to go for you, but we need to create an incentive for the people that is renting the home to be careful with your home. So basically working from the premise that all of these platforms are two-sided markets where we need to use the insurance tools that we have in order to enable more people to share their stuff, but also enable better transactions in the sense that people need to be more careful with the stuff that they're renting or swapping or bartering with. So I'm guessing a lot of people watching this are very familiar with Airbnb, use it themselves. What's, what's the status quo if I, if I used an Airbnb service and broke something? What, what tends to happen in that situation? Airbnb is kind of set apart in the sharing economy. They're such a huge player. They have a guarantee that they insure. Uh, instead, they don't have a specific insurance, but they insure the guarantee that they set out to the people renting. What we're trying to do is something for everyone that is working in the sharing economy. We're launching now on a platform in Sweden for people to rent tools and, and things between neighbors. We're also renting... Uh, a, a transport solution or people renting furniture. If I wanted to rent that sofa, for example, we could have a, a specific solution for that. So we're going to work with, with smaller scale uh, objects. Well, Sa I know Saskia sat up straight when you mentioned that. So maybe you've got a conversation <laughs> to have afterwards. Um, tell us, what's the status of Omicom now? Are you an insurance company? Uh, not really. We, we found it was very hard to build an insurance company. Uh, none of us who started this has ever worked with insurance before. So what we were trying to do was we, we started actually building an insurance company. We did everything, put all the policy documents together. We have a structure in the company with three defense lines. So we have to have a board of directors that can make the risk assessments. Then we have operative risk. And then we have a third party actually validating the risk that we're taking. But the problem was capital. We couldn't get an investor to put the money in that we needed in order to carry the risk on our own books. So what we're doing now is we partnered up with a with a huge uh, insurance company, HR Berkeley, uh, that we're very happy to work with, and and we can use them as as uh, risk carriers, basically. And what we do is we sell a tailored insurance for them, we white labeling a product, in order to get a product onto the market. And you're, I know you've been working in this for the last three years or so, but you're about to publicly launch. Is is that the right way of putting it? Yeah, we're hoping so. We're touching wood. 
So we're working together with two platforms. One, uh, cargo insurance, because we also believe that lo logistics is a really integral part of a, like the reuse and refurbishment markets in order to get that in place. We need good lo logistic solutions. So we're creating like this micro insurance for those kinds of cargo companies. And also on this uh, tool and, and asset sharing uh, platform, which is based a lot like Fat Llama in the UK, but it's called Hyglo in Sweden. So, so that's the first uh, two platforms that we're launching with. We're hoping to do that in September. Sounds to me like it'd be very useful for someone like you, Saskia. Uh, number one, you need logistics. We've talked about the back and forth of, yeah. of, the, of the modular sofas, but well, you don't need many tools to put these together, I guess. But do you hear a lot in, in what uh, Ula is telling us that uh, could be applicable to ideas you might have in the future for your business? Definitely. So like we think that actually it would make more, much more sense to lease a sofa instead of like um, selling it. Um, but we just don't really feel the market is just ready for that yet. So it is something we are exploring in the next year. And like hopefully in a few years you can lease the sofa um, for like a month or for a year. And then if you want to have like updates, it's kind of more, it's like you don't own the sofa. So hey, definitely have to talk. Insurance is actually a huge part of why <laughs> yeah. the market isn't really ready. We saw that like 72% of consumers weren't ready to take that step if there weren't such an insurance solution in place that would that would take care of them if something happened. And right now that's not the case. Yeah. Do, um, so you, are you predicting uh, an increase in demand for sharing services once the insurance is in place then obviously? We're really hoping so. Like that's the whole point of <laughs> why we started Omocom. Uh, so that's the effect we're hoping to have. Um, you're launching then this month. What, what should people be looking out for? Or, or how do you go, let me rephrase this. How do you go about finding businesses who might be uh, those you work with to start with? Right now we have a queue of platforms lining up to, to use us. So I think we have 12 platforms in queue and we don't have the developers enough to, to adapt the API to all the things that we would like to do. So, so we haven't really had to look for platforms yet. <laughs> They've been coming to us. So we, we, what we do, we want to do is to branch out and like see where we can create the, the best incentives to actually create uh, a bump for, for the sharing economy. So we were looking at like sharing furniture, sharing clothes. Uh, we're also starting to look at leasing as a, as a concept for different business to business solutions where IT is a huge uh, waste manufacturer. Uh, so, so looking at different solutions for business to business lease of, of IT would also be really interesting from our perspective. Is insurance one of those situations or, uh, that people tend not to speak about or tend not to think about? It's, it's the checkbox at the end of the process. Is that something that you find? It's never going to be sexy. That's true. And that's like one of the things that we feel that there's a lot of startups and we talk about it in the startup community. That's like a thing that insure tech is really hot among startups now because everyone feels that it's a, one of the areas that really hasn't been disrupted yet. At the same time, it's so incredibly heavy on the legislative side and so boring in many senses that a lot of companies don't want to touch it. But that's why we feel that it's, it's so important to do something about it. In your experience of setting up Omicom, what's been the, the most difficult hurdle to get over to get you to this point? Uh, the regulatory parts, most definitely. Uh, so meeting all the legal requirements of what we want to do on the financial side with the, all the, the insurance framework to actually create a product that's legal and also like data protection and GDPR and everything that we're doing there. It's very, since we're calculating risk on the relationship between you two users and we're using the transaction data from the platforms in order to calculate the risk, it's very easy for us to become something that instead of being good would be quite horrible if we start to monitor people too hardly or, or start doing something that that uh, would be profiling in a we, we might become racist without even knowing it if we were not really careful would do uh, GDPR wise so we put a lot of effort into like the legal framework for insurance but also the legal framework for data protection and everything we're doing on that side 
Let me come to you then to ask you with a similar sort of question, the difficulties that you've faced, what's been the biggest hurdle in terms of setting up SOFA for life? Um, I would say like regulations were quite a big part as well. Because like in the moment the SOFA regulations are of like the fire retardants that are being used. Um, so like the fire regulations are quite um, like very much focused on like foams. So as soon as you want to use anything different, uh, other materials, it suddenly gets really confusing of like, how do you test it properly? Like it's actually naturally fire retardant. Do we even need this? Like it's just kind of, it's a bit of a minefield. Um, and we've been like trying out so many different materials. Um, and so, yeah, that's been just been a bit of a... <laughs> And Nightmare. I guess you've got a data protection question as well because you're talking about SOFA for life and having that relationship with yeah. people for a long time. So it must be boring paperwork for you to get through too. Well, we are not just there yet because we are um, still at the production process of the SOFA. And so like the plan is we're selling SOFAs in the next year and then we would start doing the kind of return and updating scheme um, later on. So, But this is something we definitely have to look at so that maybe would be like another thing we can, <laughs> could have a chat about. Yeah. So you're both in the position of, uh, on the precipice of publicly launching what it is that you do. Uh, what advice would you have, Ula, for people who are watching this, maybe they're circular entrepreneurs who want to launch something. What's been, um, yeah, what would be your biggest piece of advice to those watching this? Don't give up and don't stop. And like Saskia said about the regulations are not adapted to, like the society as a whole is not adapted to these circular models. So when you talk to people that are really into a linear model or a linear business model, everyone is going to tell you that this can't be done because the mindset and the framework that they're working from is, is completely different. So I have so many people telling me that this can't be done. I had so many like insurance companies, people on the legal side, investors, everyone is having this linear perspective and they're not seeing, if you're not starting from the same point of view, they're going to tell you, no, it can't be done. So keep going is basically my, if you have an idea and you have a vision of where you want to turn, not only your company, but society as a whole, then you can make those two align. But al alongside those naysayers, you must also have had people supporting and encouraging you because uh, something must have helped you get to this point. Of course, definitely. So turn to that. <laughs> it's another <laughs> advice. How about you, Saskia? You, you said earlier you started uh, without a background in designing furniture. I guess in the same way Ula said he's not worked in insurance before, you must have learned a lot to get to this point. What's your biggest piece of advice you give to any budding circular entrepreneurs? <laughs> Oh, um, wow. Yeah, I feel like on the kind of same vibes, it's, it's like, I think the motivation is like one of the things that's it's, it's hard. It's like, it's a lot of work um, and you have to learn a lot, but um, just kind of keep going and like motivate yourself. And the, like <laughs> what you said beforehand, um, yeah, um, I totally forgot what I wanted to say. I had something I wanted to respond to. Um, no, I think the the fact that the circular economy is that it, we, we have to change that. I feel like there's not, not a choice and that's what motivates me most. It's like, if I'm like, oh God, what am I doing? Like, why am I doing this? It's like, well, there's no way we continue, can con con continue like this. So like there has to have, like a change has to happen and there are no circular economy sofas out there yet. So that's my point where I start. And it's like, it's a small step, um, but I feel like that there's like ultimate um, we have to do this like this. There's actually no choice. Um, which yeah. leads me on to what I think will be a final question, which is how the concept of a circular economy, how do you explain that to people? What, like, what's the selling point you tend to use when you approach newbies to it? I think from for personally, when I heard the first time circular economy, like the biggest aha moment was when I realized that there's no waste in nature. And that is like in nature, everything biodegrades and everything has like another purpose and there is no waste. And like, so that the fact that waste is a concept, I think that was like the most important thing for me to understand that I was like, it's human made, it's man made. And I think if you're at that point then you know, okay, it's man made. So like we are, like we can unmake it as well. So like we can create a world where there's no waste, so. I'll, I'll ask you that question in a second, Ula, but first a question from uh, the online audience. Where does your revenue come from? Could you explain a little bit more? We haven't launched yet, so we don't have any revenue. <laughs> but the basic idea is that we have an API uh, that is linked to the platforms. So the user 
in the cargo case, they will they will have an, uh, an option to buy an insurance when they're transporting a sofa, for example. So we have a little micro insurance for like three pounds. At, uh, they have the option to click in if they want an insurance for that specific sofa just during the transport. Perfect. And then back to you then with that question, the selling point of the circular economy, you've got a, a circular business in mind or one that can enable a circular economy. What's your selling point when you speak to people who are new to this? I think it's, it's, it's really easy for people to understand the concept of waste. So I just really try to say that we're enabling people to share stuff so that they don't have to buy stuff and that reduces waste in the long run. So, so yeah, okay, basically I'm reducing waste in that sense. Thank you, Ula, and thank you to Saskia. Thank you. So two circular businesses there in the studio for you. We've talked a little bit about policy and regulation. If that is something that gets you up in the morning, then we've got a session tomorrow's diff about uh, policy and finance to scale the circular economy in Latin America. Look on thinkdiff.co to see when that session is on and also when all of our other sessions are on because we're live for these three days. Thank you very much for watching and I look forward to seeing you next time. We need to start making more conscious material choices. I set up an initiative called Make Fashion Circular. It's a tsunami of change.